to the chase, evidence based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, so we're living in a world with an astounding uptick in using pharmacology as a means of optimization. And for the most part, although people want to look better or feel better, there are metrics, at least clinically, that guide a lot of these choices due to the common and prevalent disease of metabolic syndrome, for instance, amongst other factors. And when we think of metabolic syndrome, we recognize its presence itself is correlated to a ton of different comorbid medical conditions. And something I've noticed is that when these two units universes of pharmacology and human optimization collide. As a result, there seems to be a lot of bro science, gatekeeping, and confusion about who can and who can't use certain compounds. It's a bit absurd to me. So the purpose of this video isn't to tell you what to do or what not to do or what you can do, but instead to educate on why people are prescribed testosterone, why people are taking semaglutide, and what research says about taking them both together, and does research exist in this regard. So TRT, we've all heard about it. Testosterone replacement therapy, we know multiple influencers who really can't stop running their mouth about the topic. And I think to plenty of people, this is actually life-changing, as it's clinically indicated in symptomatic individuals with low or low normal testosterone, and its replenishment is oftentimes used to not only alleviate these symptoms of low T, but to also reduce metabolic risk in these people who, understandably, have more trouble maintaining lean body mass. There are also lots of intricacies about TRT and different types of hypogonadism, and I'll save all the specifics for the testosterone-focused channels, as there are plenty. But the one or biggest confounder to management, in my opinion, that I'll point out, and somewhat of a gray area in the space, is the huge range range of quote-unquote normal values. It's understandably complex to gauge what's normal versus somebody's own individual normal. And as such, it's likely tough to ascertain who is a candidate for TRT, not to mention the variability in how somebody responds to a certain level of endogenous testosterone production, right? Who's to say that one person at 500 nanograms per deciliter feels the same as somebody else who sits around the same morning measurement at baseline? Point being, using endogenous testosterone isn't as simple or even stream Lined, as we may think, and as such, people titrate their prescribed doses up and down, achieve monitoring labs, and with their clinicians develop their own protocol, ideally at least, and that's how I feel it should be. And just like people can find dissuading factors towards testosterone replacement, they exist with semaglutide too. Gastrointestinal upset isn't remotely uncommon. And on top of that, you'll see influencer providers like Peter Atia saying people on it lose muscle without substantial evidence. However, just like with hopping on TRT, hopping on Ozempic should weigh the risks and benefits. As in, for the majority of the population who's on it, I would probably argue that Atiyah's perspective is imbalanced and based off his clientele. As in, from a longevity and metabolic risk profile standpoint, I would, in my humble opinion, imagine that the obese and diabetic people prescribed it benefit from the substantial weight loss more than they would detriment from the subtle muscle loss. However, that's my take. But I digress. I think I feel obliged to share all these thoughts because I recognize that talking about these compounds individually, not to mention in combo, would most definitely be met with some sort of disagreement, which I always welcome. But let's get on with it and try to learn together. But before we do, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. It's the best and only way to help a small peptide YouTuber like me. So semaglutide wasn't the first GLP-1 agonist developed. However, it has grown uncontrollably popular and propelled Novo Nordisk stock to new heights. And besides old chemical fat burners that came with severe and sometimes fatal consequences, this isn't only the most mainstream weight loss product to exist, but also in many cases it's come with benefits like improvements in metabolic risk profile like cholesterol numbers, waist circumference, HbA1c, not to mention the vitality and psychological benefits that come with being at a healthier body weight. And as such, there are currently three FDA-approved semi glutide only products, OOO Ozempic, Rebelsis, and Wegovi. And Ozempic and Rebelsis are indicated for management of type 2 diabetes in conjunction with diet and exercise, and Wegovi is approved for management of obesity in conjunction with lifestyle factors as well. 
We've previously talked about the spin-offs of semaglutide, if you will, like terzepatide, i.e. Monjaro, and Zepbound, that also agonize GIP receptors, and the newest sequel, Ritatrotide, that agonizes glucagon receptors as well, thus it's known as a triple receptor agonist. And it appears that the more agonistic features that are added, they don't drastically alter the products or results, but Big Pharma will likely keep coming out with slightly different products because that money is crazy. That said, some research has shown people taking terzepatide may be prone to greater proportion of body weight loss than would someone on semaglutide. However, both patient populations in general have found benefit notwithstanding adverse effects. And the relationship between testosterone replacement and semaglutide is quite interesting when we think about the relationship between obesity, metabolic dysfunction, and testosterone levels in general. So there's a well-known observation in that obese men have lower testosterone levels on average than lean men, albeit other factors exist like age, sleep, activity level, and likely even ethnocultural differences. Not to mention as we age and our testosterone levels decrease, we're more prone to what is essentially replacement of muscle by fat through skeletal muscle fat infiltration, which is part of the natural aging process and is interestingly affected by exercise as well in that resistance training could contribute towards preventing this. So we've got a relationship between fat mass, testosterone, and age in that it is more likely an obese version of you would have a lower testosterone level than would healthy weight you. It's also more likely that 70-year-old you would have a lower testosterone level than 30-year-old you. Now to extrapolate what hypothesis we can create based off somebody prescribed TRT and prescribed semaglutide, so in a metabolically unhealthy or obese person with hypogonadism, I imagine the result could be, in a way, mutually beneficial, in the sense that the patient would more likely lose fat while preserving muscle, thus influencing body weight, increasing lean muscle presence, positively affecting insulin sensitivity as well. I can also imagine a scenario in which an obese person is with increased water retention and mass due to TRT, thus predisposing or worsening other conditions like sleep apnea, which in and of itself could be dangerous or deleterious before adequate fat loss is maintained. So in my head, this can go either way, but I'm tempted to say that a clinically obese and clinically hypogonadal man will find benefit due to the circular nature of being both large and low T. They go hand in hand. Now, these are just my thoughts before diving into the data. So does the research say anything in particular about these two compounds in combo? Well, Understandably, there's not much, but interestingly, a study took place to take a look at the proposed risk of erectile dysfunction in obese people prescribed semaglutide for weight management as it's an indicated possible adverse outcome. And what they noticed was that although not particularly common in a population of people who hadn't previously suffered from ED, the presence of erectile dysfunction and low T put the semaglutide group at increased risk for development of such. It didn't affect many. However, the results placing these people at higher risk for both were statistically significant. Additionally, at the 26th European Congress of Endocrinology that took place in Stockholm, Sweden, an abstract was presented that took a look at semaglutide versus TRT in obese diabetic men average aged 50 at a low sample size. And the data showed essentially a similar increase in testosterone among both groups and more improved body composition by the semaglutide group. And I imagine the results are confounded by limitations in the study, not only sample size, but also the unclear dosing regimen by which participants received this longer-lasting testosterone undecanoate. Not to mention the lack of specific data since it's just an abstract presented at this conference, so it's quite likely unreliable. It's something that I didn't really have to bring up, but you know, to me it's pretty interesting and I just wanted a second piece of data to reference, but keep in mind that actually holding this article to strong credibility and legitimacy is a stretch, but I can see one of you finding it and pointing it out to me and saying, well, research has showed this, so I just wanted to cover my tracks here point out something fascinating, that's really the only purpose of mentioning that one. So let's break down some final thoughts here, which I consider important. Uh, first, in that an obese and or diabetic hypogonadal person could benefit from both of these compounds individually, and thus likely they could benefit from them in combo. It makes sense. Not only is it possible to decrease weight, but on top of that, due to preservation of muscle and improvement in lipid profile and HbA1c, it's not unlikely that somebody would be in a better status of both metabolic and cardiovascular health, like they could very well be doing with semaglutide alone, for instance, and maybe even TRT alone. How 
However, adding TRT to an obese person more prone to sleep apnea and also more prone to developing a thromboembolism or blood clot could at least transiently increase risk of a development of these dangerous scenarios given the well-known increased risk TRT presents for both of these conditions. And so the claim that it'll definitely be a synergistic combo, well, it's hard to tell and hasn't truly in a clinical setting been evaluated. And so, yeah, I could sit around here saying, you know, this is what I think will happen and make these claims, but the point of this channel is to have research that we can turn to and evaluate. What I can say and my greatest recommendation would be to, if considering this combo, to gain your physician's assistance. The best way to mitigate risk is to not only clinically determine this risk, assess benefits, and on top of that, as part of creating a health full of risk profile as you can, monitor labs regularly, track how you feel, and how your body on a chemical and vascular level looks too. The importance of monitoring and clinical oversight is, as always, really important. Now, I do have multiple videos breaking down how semaglutide, terzepatide, and even ritatretide work, and so I'll make sure they're linked either at the end of the video or in the description below, likely even both. And that's why I really didn't include all the mechanistic data here in this video. That said, I appreciate the time. If you're looking for a way to further support the channel, the link to the Patreon will be in the description below. We have some member-only videos, and a lot of the content I make, whether on the Patreon or on the main YouTube channel, do come from these Patreon member suggestions. So thank you so much. I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.